Let's be turning in our Bibles to 1 Timothy chapter 5. 1 Timothy chapter 5. I want to say good morning to everyone. We're thankful to have an opportunity to be together. And we have some visitors among us, and we're delighted that you're here with us. This morning, uh, not doing a typical sermon in the way that we think about it, I had asked the elders uh, several weeks ago if, if it would be all right sometime after, uh, shortly after our arrival here, would it be okay for me to do uh, kind of an introductory sermon, get to know the walkers. Just kind of talk about ourselves a little bit, of course not in a boastful way, but just kind of letting you know who we are and uh, where we're from and what we've been doing the past six years in Alabama and uh, kind of talk about my approach to my work as a preacher. And the elders said that that would be fine and I thought that we could do that together this morning. And so we're going to be looking at some things that we, that we see in First and Second Timothy, particularly as Paul writes to Timothy and talks to him about his work and what his role as a preacher is. And I'm going to make some applications to myself and just let you all kind of get a behind the scenes glimpse of what exactly it is that I do as a preacher. Let you have an idea of what you can expect from me as a preacher. And so I invite you to get out your Bible and study along with me this morning as we talk about some things about preaching. So let me spend just a couple of minutes first and just talk about my family. Stacy and I are both Middle Tennesseans. I was born in Franklin, Tennessee, just south of Nashville. And I grew up in a town called Tullahoma, Tennessee, just a small town, about 20,000 people or so in southern Middle Tennessee. Stacy was born in Michigan, but moved to Tennessee when she was a baby. She was a year old when uh, her dad took a job with GM in Spring Hill, Tennessee, south of Nashville. And we grew up about 40 miles apart, but we never knew each other until we had both grown up and moved away from home. Stacy is a graduate of Middle Tennessee State University in Murfreesboro, Tennessee, who won their first ever, I believe, NCAA tournament basketball game uh, last week. And then they lost in the, the second round, but uh, go Blue Raiders. That was pretty impressive. Um, and I graduated from the University of Alabama in Huntsville. And if you're looking for them in the NCAA tournament bracket, you won't find them. Uh, that's a Division II school. So they play pretty good basketball, but not in Division I. But school in Huntsville is what took me to Alabama from, uh, from Tennessee. And I went to, went to Huntsville for school in 2008 for my junior year of college and uh, been in Alabama ever since. So we met in June of 2009 and we married in December of 2009. So we um, had a pretty brief courtship and engagement. And if my daughters ever do that to me, <laughs> I will punish them severely and I will kill the would-be sons-in-law. We were blessed with our first child, Kinley, in April of 2013, so she'll be four in just a few weeks. And Hallie, our second and soon to be middle, Lord willing, uh, she came to us in March of 2015, so she just turned two a couple of weeks ago. So that kind of gives you just a brief synopsis of uh, who we are and where we're from. But we've been a preaching family for about seven and a half years, and we've been in Alabama for all that time. I started preaching in an internship with the Jordan Park Church in Huntsville, Alabama. Some of you may be familiar with that church or know some people there. I didn't have lifelong dreams or aspirations of preaching. It's kind of just something that developed primarily because of this internship. I have a granddad who was a gospel preacher for uh, many years. In fact, I've never asked Bill, but does the name Eulane Walker mean anything to you? Okay, well, my granddad preached in uh, primarily West Tennessee for all of his life. Um, he passed away three years ago. I had an uncle who preached uh, before his death just a couple of years ago. So preaching is, is something that's been in and around my family for all of my life. And it's something that I'd given some thought to doing, but never really serious thought until I started this internship in Huntsville. 
The Jordan Park Church had never done a training program before. It's something they'd always wanted to do, and they asked me if I would be the guinea pig. I had spoken there a couple of times filling in for the local preacher, and I guess they felt like I had some potential and some talent in preaching, and so they asked me, would you be interested in doing this? And so my senior year at university um, there in Huntsville, I started this internship, and it was going to be a one-year program, and I thought, well, I, I don't really want to preach. I, I've thought about it, but never really given it too strong of consideration, but hey, I'll, I'll do this program for one year, and if I like it, then I'll start preaching. If I don't like it, if I determine preaching is not for me, well, it, it's been a good thing to do. I've got some Bible knowledge, I've got some public speaking experience for a year, and I, nothing bad could come from this. So that's kind of the way that I, I went into this internship. And about two months into the internship, I, I knew preaching was what I wanted to do. Just I started doing it regularly and studying and, and being with people and opening the scriptures, and, and it, it was just... It was just very appealing, but, but very, um, very fulfilling. And so I graduated from Alabama Huntsville knowing that I wasn't going to pursue graduate work in my degree as I had planned, uh, but I was going to begin preaching. So I did the internship there for one year, and when we finished that year... I had started looking for some churches to work with on a full-time basis, but nothing had come. So the elders there said, well, let's just go month to month, and whenever you find something, you can go. So we did that for four months. So I was in this internship for 16 months in Huntsville. And then we started working with the Westview Church in Hartsell in January of 2011. And so we were with the Westview Church for six years up until now our time here at Taylor's and we're looking for many good years here in South Carolina. So what I want to do with you now is kind of spend the rest of our time talking about just my philosophy of preaching. Kind of my approach to the work that I do, the way that my family approaches our work as a preacher and family. And I want to look at some things Paul says to Timothy that kind of serve as a, a foundation and a model for some of the things that I, I think about my preaching. Let me start in 1 Timothy chapter 5. Look with me at verse 8. But if anyone does not provide for his own, and especially for those of his household, he is denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. I want to make some comments about my family first. And I want to use this verse really as a springboard for the things that I'd like to say about my family. It's critically important that all of you understand that my role as a husband and a father comes before my work as a preacher. You husbands and you fathers, you understand that your family needs you. They need you to guide them. They need you to lead them. And that's no different for me. I can quit preaching the gospel and still get to heaven. But I can't quit being a husband and quit being a father and still get to heaven. So my family is the first priority. Now, there are a number of ways that we provide for our families. Now, this passage, I think, primarily is talking about financially and working to support our families financially. And through your gracious generosity, this church has agreed to fully support me so that my family can be financially supported through my preaching of the gospel. But we have to also provide for our families in ways that are non-material. So my family needs my spiritual provision. They need my emotional provision. And so I need to be there for my family in the same way that you husbands and fathers need to be there for yours. So I'm not going to be a preacher who works diligently to save the world and yet lose my own family. So what that means practically is there may be times when I have to say no to you in order to say yes to my family. And I need you to understand that. 
I need you to appreciate that. Now, I will do my absolute best to say yes to you as much as I possibly can. I want to be there to help you. I want to be there to serve you in whatever way I can. But there may be a time when I say, I'm sorry, my family needs me right now. I would be understanding if you had said that to me. And so I simply ask for the same from you. I need you to help me keep that balance. And so I need you to come to me and say, Ben, how are things at home? Are you spending enough time with Stacy? Are you seeing your children enough? I need you to ask me those kinds of questions. Because, like so many of us men, it's easy for me to become a workaholic too. It's easy for me to become too consumed in my work, just like so many of us can do. And I need you to help me keep that balance. I can't wait for you all to get to know Stacy. Stacy is the biggest supporter of my work that I have. She is an incredible help to me. She is a hard worker, a diligent worker. She's creative, she's supportive, and she goes 100 miles an hour all the time. It's not uncommon for her to come to me and say, okay, I've got some ideas. I want to do this, 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 and this, and I kind of pull on the reins and say, slow down a little bit. I have to do that a lot, and you'll see that in her. But I do think that you won't see that Stacy immediately. We do have a baby coming along, and there's going to be some transition for us in that. Transition not only moving our house and all of the possessions and all of the transition with learning about how to get to places and how to go to the grocery store without getting lost and, and all of that. Um, but you know how it is when you bring a new child, whether it's your first or your fifth, uh, there's always some adjustment that comes when a new baby comes. And so not only are we adjusting to a new work and a new city, but we're also adjusting to a new baby. And so we are not going to be able to hit the ground running as quickly as we would like to. But bear with us. Be patient with us. Uh, we'll get there. After we make those adjustments, uh, I think you'll see that Stacy and I both are trying to be hard workers. And we, we're always busy. Um, and I don't say that boastfully, but I, I just I say that to say we're coming to work. I'm not a preacher who plays golf every week. I'm not a preacher who sits in the office and, and just takes things easy and I, I, I don't have cruise control, okay? We don't believe in cruise control. We work. We come to work. That's why you're supporting us. That's why the elders invited us to come. We're here to be busy. So those are some things that I need you to understand about my family as we are coming through this adjustment period. We need your help as we go through this period. There may be times when Stacy feels a little bit overwhelmed. I can tell you she already feels overwhelmed. But as we get here and as we're going through those adjustments and as we're trying to uh, unpack boxes and, and get settled and all of that, there's going to be times where we need some help. And we may need to call you and say, could you come and help us for 30 minutes or an hour or something? We, we, we may do that. And... I hope that, that you will be open to that. So let me share some things now with you about me personally and some things that I need to personally be aware of. Go to chapter 4 of 1 Timothy. Look with me at verse 16. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 16. Pay close attention to yourself and to your teaching. Persevere in these things. For as you do this, you will ensure salvation both for yourself and for those who hear you. Pay close attention, he says, to two things. Number one, he says, to yourself. And number two, to your teaching. Now, most preachers don't have any problem paying attention to their teaching. We come up with sermons every week. We're teaching Bible classes uh, publicly and privately. We are focusing on our teaching. And we want our sermons to be good. We want them to be beneficial. We want our Bible classes to be informative. And so we pay close attention to our teaching. That's not usually the area where preachers get lazy. 
But sometimes preachers have not been as vigilant to pay close attention to themselves. And there's a number of applications of that that we could make. But I think when Paul says to Timothy, pay close attention to yourself. I think what he's saying is, Timothy, pay close attention to your personal purity. Your personal morality. Your personal reputation and character. There are a number of things in 1st, 2nd Timothy and Titus where Paul says to these young preachers, keep yourself pure. Keep yourself free from lust and covetousness and greed and whatever other trappings we could get into. I will take whatever steps necessary to keep my personal life pure and respectable. Unfortunately, I have seen preachers, and you have too, who have not been so vigilant and they've gotten themselves into trouble. They've gotten themselves into some kind of moral impropriety, moral sin. And so I have established rules and boundaries for myself in order to prevent myself from tempting and compromising situations. I do not ever meet, study with, or counsel with women by myself. Period. If a woman calls me and she wants to come talk to me or study with me, I am more than happy to do that. But ladies, understand, if you ask that of me, my wife or someone else will be present. If I'm here at the church building, and I do plan to have an office here at the church building. If I'm here at the building and one of you ladies comes up to work on class material or VBS material or something like that, I may or may not leave the church building and go probably to a coffee shop somewhere and uh, study there. Understand, I'm not leaving because it's you. But I may be leaving simply to just make sure that there's never any doubt raised in the minds of anybody. Now, the only exception that I would make to my being alone with a woman is if, you know, sister so-and-so who's 114 needs a ride to the doctor. All right? I'll do that. I will gladly do that. Um, but that's, that's a boundary that I've set for myself that may seem a little strange. It may seem excessive. But I need that. That's a boundary that I've set up for myself. And I need you to respect that. I believe in accountability. I believe in having people in my life who will keep me on the straight and narrow. Who will ask me questions. Who will, who will ask me questions that will keep me thinking clearly, um, but, but most importantly, thinking purely. Turn to 2 Timothy chapter 2. I believe Paul wanted Timothy to believe in accountability. 2 Timothy chapter 2, look at verse 22. So here's where Paul says to Timothy, pay attention to yourself in these moral areas. Now flee from youthful lusts and pursue righteousness, faith, Love and peace. So, so here's one of those statements where Paul says, Timothy, pay attention to yourself and your moral reputation and your character. Flee from youthful lusts. Now, I know that when we read that, we immediately think about sexual lust. And that's certainly included. But I think the lust of money would also be included in this. Or whatever other kinds of carnal lusts that, that particularly young people find themselves being trapped in. Flee from those things. Pursue righteousness, peace. And then notice in verse 22 at the end of the verse, he says, Pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. What that says to him is, Timothy, you're not doing this alone. You need to be pursuing these things while fleeing these other things with like-minded people. 
And so what that means to me is even preachers need accountability. So I need you to help me be the preacher that God wants me to be. I need you to encourage me and assist me in that regard. I need you to come to me and ask me questions from time to time about my spiritual life and my spiritual habits. I need that. Just like you, I believe, need that. And so we do this with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. And in order for me to keep my heart and my mind as pure as they need to be, I need your help. Just like I believe you can use the help from others. Now I want to leave First and Second Timothy and I want to start to look at a broader perspective here. Go with me to Ephesians chapter 4. Now we'll come back to Second Timothy in just a moment. So if you want to keep your finger there, you can do that. But look at Ephesians chapter 4 now. Ephesians chapter 4. If I were to ask you, what do you believe my job as a preacher is? What would immediately come into your mind? Now, I think for many of us, we would say, well, the preacher, you know, he, he preaches twice a week, and so a preacher's job is to fill the pulpit. He teaches Bible classes once or twice a week, and so he's to teach those classes. Uh, that, that's the preacher's job. Be in the pulpit, teach Bible classes. Well, let me look at Ephesians 4 with you. Let's see what Ephesians 4 says about what my role as a preacher is, and then we'll try to incorporate some of those things that we typically think about. Look at Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 11. And he, Jesus, gave some as apostles and some as prophets and some as evangelists and some as pastors and teachers. These are gifts that Jesus gave to his body. And so you have four different categories. I know there's five terms listed, but I believe when it says pastors and teachers, I think the idea of that expression is actually pastors who are teachers. So there's actually four positions, four gifts that Jesus gave to the church. First, you have apostles, and those are the twelve that we think about, as well as Paul. Uh, the apostles were the special chosen ambassadors of Jesus Christ who went out with His authority, guided by His Holy Spirit, and they were preaching His message. We do not have living apostles today. Then next you have the prophets. Now, the apostles were prophets, but not all prophets were apostles, okay? The prophets were inspired men who spoke and wrote down the scriptures, wrote down and preached the message that the Holy Spirit inspired them to preach. We don't have prophets in that sense living today. The Holy Spirit is no longer guiding men into truth in the way that he was in the first century. But the last two positions that he mentions in verse 11, evangelists, and pastors or elders or bishops, we do have those with us today. So what is the evangelist to do? What are these pastors to do? What were all of these gifts that Jesus gave to the church given to do? Well, look at verse 12. These were given for the equipping of the saints for the work of service to the building up of the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a mature man to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. Focus on verse 12. These gifts from verse 11 were given in order to equip the saints for service. So what is my job as a preacher? Well, my job as a preacher is to teach and equip the body. Equip God's people through that teaching for service. So we are to teach you how to become servants. How to serve the Lord, how to serve His people, how to serve those in this world. Now the main way that we do that is by the teaching of God's Word. And so we teach week after week, and as each one grows in knowledge, 
then we as evangelists and pastors have a responsibility to not only impart knowledge, but to provide for you opportunities to develop that knowledge and to put it into practice. So we have an example of that that's going to happen tonight when Brother Clark preaches to us. And I'm looking forward to hearing his message tonight. He's not preaching tonight to give me a break from the pulpit. He's preaching because he has knowledge that he has gained through his growth as a Christian. And the elders are giving him an opportunity to share that knowledge with the church. And so God didn't require that, that preachers go to preaching schools. If he did, I'm not qualified. But what God did want is for churches to train preachers. He wanted young men to grow up in Christian homes where, where their parents, like Timothy's mother, would encourage their sons to become preachers of the gospel. And people like Paul would take those young men who are interested in preaching and teaching God's word and mentor them and help them understand what it is to be a preacher of the gospel. And so as men are growing in knowledge, they need opportunities to preach. They need opportunities to teach Bible classes. They need opportunities to stand up and lead God's people in song worship. So if a man is given an opportunity to do those things, if he's given an opportunity to preach, it's because he's gained a sufficient degree of knowledge. And now he has an opportunity to share that. I think sometimes we, if the regular preacher is not in the pulpit at every service, people might begin to think, well, you know, the preacher's getting time off. But really that's not the way to look at it. Because what this church is trying to do, what the elders are trying to do, what I'm trying to do, is to develop people who are capable of preaching and teaching and leading God's people. I remember some time back, I was not in the pulpit one particular uh, Sunday evening. We let another man uh, from the congregation speak. And uh, someone who I think didn't fully understand these things that I'm saying right now about my role according to Ephesians 4 and, and equipping and, and strengthening and giving opportunities to others came up to me and said, well, you, you enjoyed the night off, didn't you? And, you know, I know sometimes when people say that, you know, they say it in a joking way, but there was a maybe a little bit of a degree of snarkiness in it. And, uh, and you know, I just brushed it off and didn't think anything of it. But what that person didn't realize is that the person who preached that night, he had been in my office two days that week for a few hours each day asking me to go through and put his sermon together with him and critique and outline and help with... That was my sermon. <laughs> I put a lot of time into that sermon, but I didn't preach that sermon. But you know what? When he stood up there and he preached, I had a great degree of joy that came from that. Because the time that I spent with him, helping him put his sermon together, that was me, in some small way, equipping him for service. So that's my role in the body, to equip and to train and to help you become better servants to Him. And you help me become a better servant to Him. There's something else that, that I need to do, and this is related, but go back to 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2, this is, this is a related point. But look with me at verse 2, 2 Timothy 2 and verse 2. Paul says, the things that you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Now make a couple of comments about that verse where it says, entrust these things to faithful men. That word men, I think would better be understood with the word people. Paul is not using the gender-specific word males here. He's saying commit these things to faithful people, men and women. It's the general term for men. You know, sometimes we, we speak like this. We come into a, a, a small group that's a mixture of boys and girls, and we say, Hey, guys, 
Well, we're not only addressing the males in the group, it's just guys has become a general term that we use to speak to the entire group. That's what Paul's doing here. So Timothy, entrust the things that you've learned from me to faithful men and women. People who are faithful, people who are strong, people who are growing, you entrust these things to them so that, and this is the second thing I want us to see, they will be able to teach others also. Part of our job as Christians is to share this message with those who are not. Evangelism is not just my job as the preacher. It's all of our jobs. We are to take this message into this dark world and we are to share the message of the gospel. And you say, well, I don't really know how to do that. Well, that's okay. That's part of what I'm supposed to do as a preacher. I'm supposed to help you understand better how you could teach your neighbor the gospel. How you could help your friends and your co-workers understand the scriptures and come to know the Lord. And so we're going to look at things. Just on and on, we'll look at things about, hey, how do, how do we teach my neighbor? How do I go about having a Bible study with my neighbor? We'll talk about stuff like that from time to time. Now, it's not going to be every single week, but I'm going to preach about evangelism. I'm going to preach about going into all the world and sharing the gospel to every creature. I do that personally, I want all of us to be doing that together. If we want to see this church grow, we can't just rely on people moving in from other areas. That's not really growth. That's kind of a shifting around of God's people. If we want to have genuine, organic growth, we need to go out and convert some people. And I want to do that. And I want you to do that. I want us to help each other do that. So that's a part of my work as well. Now, let me spend a few minutes talking about my relationship with the elders. Go to 1 Timothy chapter 5. There's a few verses here that Paul says to Timothy that, that revolve around his relationship with the elders. 1 Timothy chapter 5. Look at verse 17. The elders who rule well are to be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who work hard at preaching and teaching. This passage, as well as several others in the New Testament, say that the shepherds of a congregation are worthy of honor. And I will do my best to always give it to them. The things that the New Testament instructs Christians to think and to feel and to do toward the elders are instructions that are also given to me as a preacher. There are not verses for, for Christians generally about, hey, this is how you need to think and feel and react towards your elders. And then there's verses over here that say, now for you preachers, it's different. The same verses that tell you to respect and honor and hold the elders in high esteem, they speak to me too. And I will do my very best to do that. I will support them. I will encourage them. And I will even defend them if needed. As long as I see their oversight of this church as being true to Scripture. I am not a sounding board for your complaints about the elders. If you're upset with the elders and you want to express that and you come to me, I'm not going to listen to it. I don't have some, you know, magic strings that I can pull with the elders and change their minds or make them agree with what you think they should. I don't have that power. So if you come to me with complaints and grumblings about the elders, I'm going to tell you to go away. I'm not going to listen to that. Look with me at verse 19. Do not receive an accusation. Now remember, this is written to a preacher. Do not receive an accusation against an elder except on the basis of two or three witnesses. I won't listen to your complaints about the elders. If you come to me and say, and one of our elders is involved in sin, I'll listen to you. But I will say immediately, do you have two or three witnesses? If you don't, I'm not going to listen to it. But if you do have two or three witnesses, I'll listen. And look at verse 20. Those who continue in sin. Now, who are the those? Well, in this immediate context, it's been talking about the elders. So, elders who continue in sin, rebuke in the presence of all, so that the rest 
everybody else in the church will also be fearful of sinning. Now, I am to be in submission to the elders just like everybody else in this church. But if the elders or one of the elders is involved in some sin and it's known and it's persistent, Paul says, I as a preacher should rebuke them in the presence of the whole church. And I will do that if necessary. I don't ever expect that that will happen. But if it's necessary, I will do that. So there may be times when I have some disagreement with the elders. Maybe I've got an idea for something I want to do. Uh, some new activity, some new program. And I pitch it to the elders and they say, we don't think that's a very good idea. I accept that. My response is going to be the same as everybody else's is supposed to be. I will respect their decision. I will obey them because they're my shepherds. They may have reasons for making the decisions that they make that I don't know about. Maybe I don't need to know about them. I respect that. It's okay for me to disagree with them on something. It's okay for you to disagree with them on something. But we need to be Christians when we express our disagreements. Do you know what I mean? We need to be forthright. We need to be honest. We need to go to them. We need to talk about those things. We need to express our concerns. And we need to let them speak for their own concerns as well. And we need to accept what they say. I do not believe in complaining and grumbling about the elders. I don't believe we should do it behind their backs. I don't believe that we should do it to other people without their knowledge. And as I've said, I don't want you to do it to me. Well, let me give some general comments now. Just some, uh, some things that I'd like for you to know. We'll go through these pretty quickly. First, let, let me say that there is, there's much more to my work than what you see on Sundays. Stacy and I often have people in our homes for meals and for Bible studies. I will oftentimes, just about every single week, I will be meeting with somebody in the congregation, having lunch with them, having coffee with them, talking to them about their spiritual life, talking to them about uh, just how they're doing spiritually. Um, we try to have Bible studies with people as often as we can. I will do my very best to get to the hospitals for your surgeries and your babies and all of that. I don't always make it to everything, but I will do my best to get there if it is at all possible. But I say all that to just say there's a lot of things that I do Monday to Saturday that nobody knows about. And I don't say that to defend myself. I just say that to say I want you to know that. Um, you know, the old joke about, hey, you know, preachers only work one day a week. Well, you've never seen us do that, but when you say something like that, we're actually scowling. And we're actually quite angry. <laughs> um, there's a lot that, that I do that may be behind the scenes that maybe nobody knows about. And I'm okay with nobody knowing about it. Um, I, I don't expect you to uh, have to know every single thing that I do every single day. Uh, in fact, that would be kind of oppressive to me. But um, we, we want to do... Uh, all of those things. We want to have you in our homes. We want to have Bible studies with you. We want to take an interest in the things that you're interested in. We will do our best to be interested in what you and your family are interested in. So if your children are playing ball, give us a schedule. We, we'll try to come to a ball game. We want to take an interest in that. Uh, if your daughter is in some play, let us know when it is. We, we'd love to come. We want to, as best we can, be interested in the things you're interested in. Because we are wanting to make an investment in you, in your families, in your, in your children, your grandchildren. We want to, we know that if we're ever going to have any influence on you through the teaching of God's Word, that we need to have put some time and some investment in you. And so we want to do that. Our house, which by the way, hopefully we've taken some steps in a good direction and we'll be here um, a little bit sooner than maybe we had expected. And uh, I can comment on that uh, privately. Let me get on to some other things because I'm running out of time. But once we get into a house, we plan to use it for the Lord and for His people. We want our house to be your house. 
And so we will have you over for meals. We will have singings where we invite the whole church. Uh, we will have Bible studies. We may have the teenagers come over for a movie afternoon, movie night. Uh, we want our house to be your house. Because really it's God's house. He's the one who blesses us with those things. We're simply stewards of them and we want to use them for Him and for His people. We want our house to be your house. Just give us some time to bring the baby home and settle in a little bit before you all show up on the front door. Um, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 24. 2 Timothy 2, 24. The Lord's bondservant must not be quarrelsome, but be kind to all, able to teach, patient when wronged, with gentleness, correcting those who are in opposition, if perhaps God may grant them repentance, leading to the knowledge of the truth. The Lord's servant must not be a fighter. I'm not somebody who's always looking for somebody to beat up with the Bible. I'm not going to go around and shoot people with the gospel gun and be mean-spirited in my preaching. I don't do that. I do not want you to ever be afraid to invite your friends to worship. Just like I do, you have friends, you have family members who belong to denominational churches. I will never preach a sermon about 101 reasons we hate denomination XYZ. I don't do that. I've seen that done. And I've seen what it does to people who are from that denomination, who happen to be in the audience, who hear that lesson, and the opportunity to preach the gospel to them is completely shut. And so I don't want to do that. So don't ever be afraid to invite your friends to this church. Now, I will address whatever teachings may be out there that they may or may not subscribe to, but I do not bash other religious groups. That's, again, it's a personal thing. Some preachers may differ with me. In fact, I know some preachers differ with me on that. But that's a personal thing, and uh, I, hope you, I hope you understand that. Uh, I have friends and family in those religious groups. I know good people who worship in those churches, and you do too. So I am, I am more than happy to talk with, study with your friends or family members who may be in denominations. Uh, I would love nothing more than an opportunity to do that. I love personal work. I will treat them very kindly. Do not fear about me um, you know, beating them up and being rude to them. Uh, I, I won't do that. I'll be very open to them and very, very warm and respectful. I don't preach on politics, period, ever. I don't do that. Uh, the pulpit is not a place for politics. I will not stand up here and say you should vote for this man or you should not vote for this person. Uh, there's no place for that here in my judgment. Now, there may be some political goings-on in this country, maybe some news headlines that are interesting and they give me a good topic for a sermon, and I may use it in that regard, but I will never preach politics. I try not to preach opinions either. My opinions don't matter. What matters is what the Lord says, and I'm going to do my very best to limit my preaching to what He says in His book. I don't mind preaching on sensitive subjects. You'll come to know very quickly that um, I don't have any problem talking about sex, pornography, immodesty, money, or any other taboo issues. Uh, issues that may be considered untouchable. Nothing is untouchable with me. If the Bible talks about it, it's okay for me to. That's my approach. Now, understand, for all of you parents with young children who are like, <gasps> I have young children too. I'm very sensitive to tender ears. And I go to great lengths with every sermon, but especially sermons where I'm dealing with these kinds of sensitive issues. I go to great lengths to make sure that I don't offend the little ones. Okay? Um... Jesus talked about some subjects that were difficult to talk about, and I suspect among the multitudes there were children. And uh, Jesus was tactful in the way that He discussed those things, and I think we preachers can do that too. I don't believe in this parental philosophy or preaching philosophy that says, well, I'm just never going to talk to my kids about sex, and one day on their wedding day it will just magically come into their head. 
I don't believe that. I hope you as parents don't believe that. I hope you talk to your kids and I hope you try to have open lines of communication with your kids about those kinds of subjects. Um, I'll just share this story with you. It's kind of funny. I did a sermon one time on Proverbs 7 and the immoral woman, the seductress in Proverbs 7. And I, you know, she's called a prostitute in the text. That's what she's called in some translations. And I said that word. There was a young boy in the, uh, in the assembly who went to his dad after the sermon. He said, Dad, what's a prostitute? He said, go ask Mr. Ben. <laughs> well, the boy never came and asked me, but I told his dad, who, who told me about this, I said, listen, if you don't want him to know, don't send him to me. I will tell him. Now, I'll be tactful. I'm not going to offend, but I am not afraid to talk about these things. Um, so I will from time to time talk about sensitive subjects, but I will do so in a very um, tactful way. Now, finally, 1 Timothy chapter 1. Here's a closing thought that I want to leave us with. 1 Timothy chapter 1. The way this verse reads may depend on your translation. I'm reading from the New American Standard. By the way, that is my um, translation of choice. Uh, I, I like other translations, but I like the New American Standard the best. Look with me at verse 5. But the goal of our instruction is love from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. Your translation may read a little bit differently. And depending on what translation you're reading from, there may be two ways to understand this verse. One way is that our preaching comes from love, a clean conscience, and from sincerity. That when we preach God's Word, we are preaching out of love. We are preaching out of a good conscience. We're preaching out of sincerity. The second way to understand this is that our preaching seeks to produce love and a clean conscience and sincerity. Both are true. I may preach on things from time to time that are difficult to hear. You know, those sermons that flatten everybody's feet. I preach those, just like everybody else. Um, I preach things that can be difficult to hear from time to time. But understand that whatever I say from this pulpit, it comes from a heart of love for you. I don't step on your toes just to make your feet hurt. I step on your toes to pierce your hearts with the gospel. And I do that because I love you. And I want you to become everything that God wants you to be. I'm trying to produce within you the same things that God through His Word is producing within me. And so I look forward to our time together in His service. We're excited to come and to work with you. Let's have a prayer and then we'll offer our invitation.